Ralph Mupuda, thank you so much for joining us. So I just want to start here in Nigeria because in your release, you caution about uh, the Naira's devaluation and its impact that it had on the earnings. I mean, how much of a dent did it actually make in 2023? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, the big impact, uh, you know, on our results uh, with, was that uh, we had uh, significant Naira devaluation. Uh, the Naira at the midpoint of the year was more around 462. We ended the year at 907. So, you know, almost 97% uh, devaluation uh, of the Naira. So when we consolidate at the group level, obviously, the Nigeria earnings, you know, would have been reduced. But there was a second headwind, which was that there were foreign exchange losses that came through. So when we report underlying um, earnings, headline earnings of 12.03, uh, uh, you know, almost 500, uh, uh, you know, of that was a loss uh, coming out of Nigeria. So quite significant impact uh, on the reported result. But the underlying, uh, you know, momentum that we saw in the business actually was pretty resilient. Uh, so it's the function of the, the narrow devaluation that had the most significant impact on the group reported results. So do you expect that this is going to continue throughout 2024 or will it will it start to stabilize as some people are anticipating? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the outlook for the Naira remains uh, a little bit uncertain at the moment. I um, mean, I think a lot of people are forecasting and the forecast ranges are, are quite uh, wide at the moment, uh, as uh, you will understand, Jennifer. Um, you know, in recent uh, days, the last week or so, I think we've seen the Naira retrace a bit back. I think it hit the peak of 1770 odd uh, earlier this year, but uh, has been retracing towards 13, 1400. Um, and the anticipation is that, you know, with more monetary uh, policy tightening, as well as uh, starting to see the inflow uh, of any dollars, that we should see the, the, the Naira uh, potentially strengthen. But that remains uncertain. So we're taking a bit of a cautious view that uh, the Naira will remain under pressure. But obviously, if uh, it improves, that will be a positive surprise um, and, and, uh, and, and would, would obviously welcome that. How do you hedge uh, against the Naira having such a significant impact on the rest of the business? Uh, I know you mentioned it's just one part of, of the overall group's business, but uh, what are you doing to sort of mitigate the, the losses that we're seeing from Nigeria? Yeah, look, I mean, um, there aren't, you know, too many kind of derivative instruments that we can use against, uh, you know, this FX um, uh, impacts that we've seen. Uh, but there are kind of three broad areas that we're working on uh, in terms of uh, limiting the impact of the currency devaluation. The first is to look at our, our borrowings and um, uh, that would have taken, particularly the kind of letters of credit that would have been used to procure, um, you know, capex. Uh, so looking at, you know, reducing uh, the outstanding balances there. Uh, the other is uh, we are in uh, conversations uh, with IHS, in particular around uh, some of our TAR contracts. We've sat down and we're looking at aspects that we can renegotiate uh, to lessen the impact. And the third is actually to reduce uh, expenditure. Uh, Nigeria is a big part of our expense efficiency program. We were looking to take out seven to eight billion rand of expenses out of our, our cost structures on a sustained uh, ongoing basis. So those are the, some of the initiatives that we taking. Uh, we obviously are engaged with the authorities and regulators uh, to get some um, uh, tariff increases for both voice and data uh, so that we can actually uh, you know, absorb some of the inflation related and FX related impacts that are in our operating costs, particularly the network operating costs. So those uh, discussions are ongoing. And Ralph, part of uh, the, the bright side uh, to the earnings report has been the fintech business for MTN. And I know it's something that you and the team have doubled down on, uh, especially since partnering with MasterCard. What does that growth strategy look like? Are there other partnerships that you're looking to uh, to potentially grow this and expand the fintech business across the continent? Yeah, we've been very pleased with the growth of the fintech business. I mean, they grew just on 22 percent service revenue growth. We're guiding for the next three to five years that growth in that business uh, should be in the high 20s, low 20 percentage points in terms of service revenue. So we are seeing an acceleration. We're very encouraged by seeing what we call the advanced services, which is e-commerce payments, uh, remittance, uh, and the bank tech product set. Uh, that grew nicely um, as a cohort by 55% in the year. So very pleasing uh, growth uh, uh, in that uh, uh, set of products, which we believe 
or the future fit and profitable uh, um, you know products of um, you know for the business going forward. And uh, the partnership with Mastercard will help us you know accelerate, particularly on the payment side. We have ambitions on remittance as well, uh, and we are engaging others uh, who can help us uh, to accelerate further by bringing their capabilities to bear. Uh, given the significant opportunity that we see uh, in the um, in the customer base uh, on the African continent, so to your question, yes, we are engaging uh, other partners, and if when there's something to uh, uh, you know um, you know talk about, uh, we'll communicate uh, you know at the right time. <laughs> so not today, Ralph, is what you're saying. <laughs> no, not today. That's right. <laughs> but, it, you know, I think it's interesting that you point out remittances uh, as well, because, of course, remittances make up such a big portion of, of the continent and, and the finances that are coming into the continent. How far along are you in, in sort of exploring that side of the business? Yeah, right now we've got, uh, you know, partners that we do remittance through. I mean, kind of global remittance businesses that uh, we partner. And, uh, you know, we've opened up, uh, you know, over 600 uh, remittance corridors. So we like to, you know, match in the corridors to our footprint, um, and uh, with the diaspora effect that we're seeing, you know, Africans going to the Middle East, some are going to Europe, some are going to the United States, etc. Uh, we're trying to map up those corridors where we anticipate that we'll see flows uh, outbound and inbound. Uh, so we've seen those corridors grow quite nicely, um, and uh, you know, in, in Nigeria, as an example. We're partnering, uh, you know, with a with a bank there in in Nigeria to start driving, uh, you know, remittance flows uh, uh, into the future. So we see remittance as a really big opportunity, and right now where we are, we actually just uh, basically scratching the surface. There's a long runway of growth uh, for remittance as well as the other advanced services that we see, payments and e-commerce as well as the bank tech side. How much of that, Ralph, is a part of your 2025 strategy? No, absolutely. The advanced uh, services within the fintech uh, business has been a very central part of our strategy. We wanted to move from what we call basic services, so transfers, uh, you know, cash in, cash out and transfers, um, or withdrawals. That's been the rump uh, of the earnings that we make to date. But we see that over time that those will become you know, a lot more commoditized. And we are on this journey to fast uh, adopt these advanced services, which we believe are more secure and longer term. So it is a uh, smack uh, bank on strategy to be accelerating growth, uh, you know, off those services and uh, seeking partners where it makes sense. You know, we don't have all the capabilities and we want to use all our capital. Um, and if we can use partnership capital to to drive that acceleration, we certainly would, would do that and are doing that uh, as we speak. So to your question, you know, it, this is um, uh, very much on strategy and, uh, you know, we, we're very encouraged. Uh, by the, the growth that we've seen and hence, you know, us uh, flagging that we should see this business growing uh, high 20s, early 30s in terms of service revenue development over the next three to five years. Hmm. And finally, Ralph, just in terms of 2024, the group noted elevated and ongoing volatility presenting material uncertainty to the outlook. Uh, I wonder, is that the South African election that you're potentially talking about? Is that the uncertainty uh, to the outlook for the rest of the year? No, it's probably it's much more Pan-African view. I mean, we, we anticipate that you know inflation will remain at slightly elevated levels. Uh, you know, just given what, where global inflation uh, developments are, so we don't think that we are going to see uh, inflation moderating uh, fast. And then on currencies, uh, I think the naira uncertainty we spoke about has been pleasing to see uh, in a market like uh, Ghana, and we're starting to see inflation come down and uh, the SEDI become. Uh, you know, a lot more stable. So that uncertainty is, is much more about, uh, you know, the continent in more general. Uh, we do have elections in South Africa. Um, we have elections in Rwanda and also in Ghana. So, so three of our, our key markets have elections. Um, but, you know, within the, the context of elections ongoing, we think the investment case remains very robust. The demand for data and fintech services remains very, very strong. When you see the underlying traffic growth that we're seeing in these markets, uh, so we will, uh, you know, work uh, to navigate uh, any kind of the geopolitical, uh, you know, context that we're operating in, you know, over the next uh, 12 months. So regardless of the results on May 29th here in South Africa, MTN will still operate the way that it is today? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, for us in South Africa, the big things is load shedding. 
and we've invested quite a bit around making our network resilient to load shedding. Uh, and um, we've, we will we'll invest from start of last year into this year, probably a four and a half billion rand to make our network resilient. That's the thing that's the most important for us to be able to ensure that our services are available and accessible to our customers, uh, uh, even if there is uh, load shedding. Ralph Mupita, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much.